wound God himself, seeks therefore to wound the heart of the Father by injuring the children. Christians. And so Peter says that the adversary, Satan, that's what the word means, who is also what we call the devil. The devil means malicious or slanderer. He is the accuser of the brethren, we're told. He is a deceiver. Jesus refers to him as a liar and the father of lies. So this one who is our enemy has a lot of nasty tools in his toolbox. (laughs) Slander, deceit. Accusations. And Peter says that this evil one prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now think about that. He wants to tear you limb from limb spiritually. He wants to have you for lunch. And what does Peter say? He says resist him. Resist him. We do so, and we'll see this, in the character of Christ. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus has been baptized by John. He has gone out into the wilderness. He spent 40 days in fasting, both food and water. And Satan comes and tempts him. He's looking for someone to devour. He says, turn these stones into bread. Throw yourself off from the top of the temple. Bow down and worship me. And each time Jesus responds with Scripture. The psalmist says, I hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. How important it is that we are a people of the word and of prayer that we might resist the devil when he comes to tempt us. James in his little book, chapter 4, verse 18, tells us to resist the devil and he'll flee from us. Draw near to God and he will draw near to us. That's very simple. And yet so often, well, remember Johnny and devil went down to Georgia? It might be a sin, but you're going to regret. (laughs) I'll take your bet, because I'm the best there's ever been. I'll tell you, don't get cocky with the devil. All right? Don't get cocky with the devil. Because when we stand in our own wisdom, when we stand in our own strength, when we fight because we think we got it all together, you'll lose. But when we resist Him and draw near to God, when our strength is found in the Spirit of God who dwells within us, which we'll see again here in a little bit. Boy, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll tell you, preaching twice on a Sunday morning really messes with my head because what have I already said and what have I not already said? So you guys are probably getting a jumbled mess in second service. Resist the devil. He'll flee, but draw near to God and he, God himself, will draw near to you. We need not fear the adversary. We do not need to fear the devil. Paul, in a very familiar text of Ephesians chapter 6, speaks to us. We know about the armor of God, but why do we put on the armor of God? Why do we prepare ourselves for a battle which is spiritual? Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Our enemy is not flesh and blood. So guess what? Our enemy is not the politician from the party which doesn't represent you. Our enemy is not the individual in our community who is engaged in evil activity. Our enemy is not any human being. And yet so often we make people the enemy. Paul makes it very clear that our enemy is the evil one, Satan, the adversary, the devil, the the lying, malicious slanderer who accuses us as human beings. And so we need to take up, he tells us, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and do battle.
doing battle can be quite interesting, though. Sometimes we have the wrong idea of the devil and his demons, and even of the angels of God. Sometimes we get into the yin and yang of Eastern philosophy. Please don't. Sometimes we watch too many movies and we get into the force of Star Wars. And we need Anakin to bring balance to the force. You know what happens when we take our theology from Hollywood or from the Far East? We really miss what God has to tell us in Scripture. All right? Make sure you get your theology from the right place. Get it from God. Okay? Because what God tells us in 1 John chapter 4.4, 4, and then I want to talk a little bit about my good buddy Martin. In 1 John 4.4, 4, we read, you are from God. He's speaking to Christians. So if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you are a Christian, he says, you are from God, little children, and you have overcome them, them being the evil uh, enemies that Paul talked about in Ephesians chapter 6, these, these powers of darkness. And he says, this is why, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Greater is the Christ who dwells in you by his Holy Spirit than Satan who controls this world. We understand that, I think, a little bit better when we listen to Martin Luther. Martin Luther, just, I just love to read him. He was an interesting character. And he, he put it this way, he said, be he ever so evil, the devil is still God's devil. Now think about that for a minute. Be he ever so evil, the devil is still God's devil. Let me explain that because I think it's very important. Too often, even those of us who sit in the pews in churches think that there is God and the devil. We have good and we have evil. And they are in this struggle, in this battle and who shall win? But remember, Satan is not a deity. He is not a god. He is a creature. And so Luther would say, there is God, there is one God, and be he ever so evil, the devil is still God's devil. He's down here, created being. He is a usurper. He's a rebel. And he is a loser. My dad fought in the Pacific in World War II. He was in naval intelligence. I used to tell him that that was an oxymoron. My dad would sit and listen to Japanese communiques and decipher them and then pass them up the line to those who would make the decisions on how our ship movements and troop movements would go. Dad was at Hawaii after Pearl. He was at Okinawa. And he served aboard the, the Bunker Hill, if any of you are historians and, and World War II buffs. One of the interesting things about the war in the Pacific was this. The Japanese surrendered in Tokyo Bay, VJ Day, Victory Over Japan Day. And yet because of the nature of the Pacific Ocean so large and dotted with little islands everywhere, that there were Japanese military outposts and even little bitty groups of Japanese soldiers throughout the Pacific who never got word <laughs> that the war was over. And they continued to fight. There were, there were skirmishes throughout the Pacific. And Bill Conover tells me that the final Japanese surrender was in 1971. One lone Japanese soldier, now quite old, living in a hole in the ground that he had dug out with his rifle, waiting to fight the Imperial West. 1930 years after VJ Day. Now, I use that illustration because guess what? Satan's lost. You see the symbol that we represent the church with way up there? Christ died for our sins. 
And next to that, there should be an empty tomb because Christ rose from the grave. And in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the price has been paid, sin has been atoned for, you have been purchased, and Satan has lost. And yet he still does these little skirmishes. He still fights. He doesn't want to give up. He hasn't quite got it through his thick skull that the war is over. But there will come a day. The text that Mark Moore used in Core 52 is Matthew 25, 41. Then he will also say to those on his left, he's speaking in a parable of the sheep and the goats, and the goats are the unfaithful. Those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. John says much the same in Revelation 20, verse 10, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. You see, Satan has lost. His doom is sure. What is my response? To be clear-minded, alert, and to resist him, all the while drawing near to God in prayer, in Scripture, in worship, in communion, in fellowship with the saints, in holy obedience to his will, always drawing closer and closer to God. We've talked a lot about the evil one. I want to give you just a little bit of a picture here also of those who are servants of God. Angels are also real beings. The demons are actually angels who decided to join Satan in his rebellion. One of my favorite stories is in 2 Kings chapter 6. I'm a big fan of the two characters in the Old Testament by the name of Elijah and Elisha. I think a lot of people like those two characters. They're just... You know, forget the superheroes of modern movies. These guys are awesome. And Elisha, Elisha's a fun one. Now, I didn't use this in the first service because your dad was here. But one of my favorite stories about Elisha is he's out wandering along and a bunch of kids come out and give him a hard time because he's bald. And they say, baldy, baldy. And he turns around and he curses them and two bears come out of the woods and maul the children. So kids, straighten up. <laughs> yeah, that's in the Bible. Yeah, I didn't tell that one first service. I looked at your dad and I was too scared to. <laughs> I love these guys. But one of the stories that circles around Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 6 tells of of his interference in a military efforts of the Arameans. The Arameans are trying to conquer Israel. And every time that the king of the Arameans lays out his military plan, Elisha, by divine revelation, knows about it, and he warns the king of Israel. And so the king of Israel responds appropriately with his military. And the king of the Arameans calls together his cabinet, and he's really torqued. And he says, there's a leak. One of you is a spy. Someone is telling the king of Israel what I'm planning. Who is it? And well, of course, all his cabinet members are a little bit terrified. Who's going to lose their head? And finally, one of them very cautiously steps forward and says, it's not one of us. It is the man of God in Israel. It's Elisha. Every time you plan something, God tells Elisha. And so the king of uh, the Arameans says, then we have to take Elisha out. Second Kings chapter 6. He, the king of the Arameans, sent horses and chariots and a great army to Dothan, which is where Elisha was. And they came by night and surrounded the city. Now, Elisha's not worried about anything. He's having a great night's rest. And as the evening goes on and the morning begins to break, Elisha's servant 
goes out of the house, probably going out to draw the morning water at the well or maybe to get some food at the market and bring it back and have it prepared for his master. And it's great. It says, this is in verse 15. Now, when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And his servant said to Elisha, my master, what shall we do? Now, I'm going to pause there before we go on to verse 16, because I think that that is us far too often. We step out of the confines of the church gathered and we go out into our community and we we turn on the TV and we watch the news or we get on the internet and we go to social media or we get set down with people whose lives are motivated and moved by fear and all of a sudden we go into panic mode because the world is a mess and it is a mess let's be honest Our world, our world needs Jesus. It's a mess out there, folks. And if you want to be afraid, you can be afraid. It doesn't take much. And we go, oh no, what are we going to do? And I can picture Elisha. He's probably stretching a little bit. He's smelling the bacon cooking in the... No, wait a minute, he's Jewish. There's no bacon. He's smelling breakfast being prepared. And he looks at his servant, probably a guy by the name of Gehazi that we've met in other chapters. And in verse 16, he answers and he says, Do not fear. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, and he said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And hence my title, Seeing the Unseen World. Open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of of, of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. That's pretty cool. And if you go on and read the story, it's, it's 2 Kings 6, if you want to look at it later. God strikes the Aramean army with blindness, every last one of them. And Elisha goes out, and he takes the hand of their leader, and he leads an entire army by the nose, if you will, into the capital city and turns them over to the king of Israel. Who then, under direction of Elisha, gives them food and water, pats them on the backside, and tells them to go home. And they go home and they never attack again. Because how in the world do you take on the people of God? My friends, if we open up our eyes, we will not be terrified by the struggles and the hassles and the horrible things that are going on in this world because we will see that in the spiritual realm, God is victor. And greater are those who are around us than those that we can see. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Heaven is a real place. Hell is a real place. The devil is a real being. Demons are real entities. Angels are are real created beings. And with all of that, I would remind you most of all that Jesus is really the Son of God. Because here's what happens with a message like this one. We get all curious about angels and demons. And the Bible talks about both of them. But there are gaps. It doesn't give us a a, a lot of information. And people begin in their curiosity to try to fill in their gaps with speculation. This message really isn't about angels and demons. This message is about Jesus. Because we can gaze at the things of the world or we can gaze at 
the unseen world of angels and demons, or we can fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Where are you going to fix your focus? How about on Jesus? Because he is the one who makes the whole difference. That doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that we are not to be what? Of clear mind, alert, ready to resist the devil. We've got to be alert. Also mindful of God's servants, the angels. The book of Hebrews is beautiful. It's just two texts. Hebrews 1, verses 13 and 14 says, speaking of angels, are not they all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? That, that one verse simply says that God has given the angels this task to minister to you and me. Now what does that look like? I don't have a clue. Those who like to speculate will try to fill in the gaps. But I don't know. I simply trust the one who has said, hey, you're my servants. Go take care of my other servants. And because that is of God, it's a good thing. And then he tells us, the writer of Hebrews, in chapter 13, verse 2, he says, don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Yeah, he calls those of us who are Christians to be hospitable people, even to those that we don't know. And he says, why? Because some have entertained angels without knowing it. Don't expect an angel to show up with great big wings and a helmet on his head and a flaming sword. Quit getting your theology from Hollywood. Stop it. Ugh. They show up in the form of a beggar on the street corner. They show up in the form of an elderly resident of a nursing home. They show up in the form of someone that is under your care in a preschool. They show up in the form of someone sitting beside you in a pew, and you may never know. And yet God has sent them into our daily experience to minister to us. Isn't that cool? Boggles my mind. Our worship team is going to lead us in another song. I have two things to say to you in, in terms of, of angels and demons in the unseen world. First of all, this. If you are a Christian, what did First Corinth, uh, excuse me, First John 4:4 4, 4 say? You who belong to God, children of God? You've overcome because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Do not be discouraged. Do not be dismayed. Yeah, this world is a mess. It is hurtling toward destruction. Let's be honest. But that's okay. Not because we don't care about people nor about God's creation, but simply because we know the end of the story. I know the end of the story, and the end is perfect. So if you're a follower of Christ in this day of uncertainty and of confusion and of fear and of anger and of anxiety and all kinds of stuff, this message hopefully encourages you, do not be dismayed, do not be discouraged, do not fear. But this message also comes with a warning. If you are not today a follower of Jesus Christ, then that promise that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world isn't yours. Those are words for the follower of Christ. That's the words for Christians. And if you're not a Christian, then yes, this world is scary and you should be scared. Until you take hold of the one who laid down his life for you. And so as we sing, I'm going to invite you, I'm going to challenge you, be saved from this current generation, which is what Peter tells the crowd in Acts chapter 2. We're also going to use this to kind of prepare our thoughts, because one has paid the price and made all things well, and we're going to share in the bread and in the cup, and Rich will lead us in that in just a minute. Will you stand as we sing?
seated. I was just kind of glancing around here because I think maybe Bill was a little afraid this morning. It, it wasn't so brave when there's three bald guys here at first service, and now there's only one of us left. <laughs> anyway, Numbers 2, verses 1 and 2, says, Then the Lord gave these instructions to Moses and Aaron. When the Israelites set up camp, each tribe will be assigned its own area. The tribal divisions will camp beneath their family banners on all four sides of the tabernacle, but at some distance from it. And Matthew 1, verse 23 says, Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Well, summertime is a camping season for, for quite a few people. It's a great time to be outdoors. And the, my memory of camping kind of goes back to when I was in Vietnam. I was in the Army. And I was in the infantry, so I camped daily for a better part of a year. I packed, and I carried, and I prepared all the food, shelter, and clothing all the time. And when I got back, well, people asked me, would you like to go camping? I vowed that I wasn't going to be camping for the foreseeable future. That was... 50 years ago, and uh, I've maintained that vow to this day. Anyway, the uh, Israelites camped in the wilderness for 40 years. They had no permanent homes, and they lived in tents. The arrangement was set by God, and each, each tribe had their assigned uh, place to be. All tribes camped around the tabernacle. That was at the center of the camp, and it was a place where God was present and where he lived among his people. God was at the heart of the Israelites' life and their wilderness journey. The truth that God is with us is one of the most repeated verses in the, uh, in the Bible. God tells us he'll be with us wherever we go, and that he'll be faithful, never leave us, and he'll never forsake us. Today we know that he came to live, live among us in the person of his son, Jesus. And at, and at birth, Jesus was called Emmanuel, which is God with us. That promise should encourage all of us through the, the wilderness of our life's journey. Remember that God's given us the greatest gift of all, his son. And uh, that's our grace for our salvation. Jesus was crucified on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And uh, we should be living with God in the center of our lives so we can spend eternity with him. Just ask you please keep that in mind as we partake of these emblems which represent Christ's body and blood that he shed on the cross for our forgiveness of our sins. Would you pray with me please? Dear God, we can't thank you enough for living amongst us and showing us your unconditional love and forgiveness by sending your Son, who is willing to die on the cross for the forgiveness of our, our sins. And just help us to focus on that greatest gift that you could give us and help us to be mindful of Christ's sacrifice as we partake of these emblems that represent his body and blood shed for us. We give you all the praise and glory, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. so glad that you were able to join us today both in person and online and I would just like to give you a couple reminders 
Um, please stay in your pews until you have been dismissed. And also, please do not congregate in the Narthex. So um, just a reminder, we, we want to make sure that we're following good um, distancing rules so that uh, we can be able to continue to come and worship together. So if you please stand to sing with us.